Good morning. I mentioned in one of my previous devotionals um, that I've developed a pattern through the years of reading through the Bible. And one of the things that I do is I start every day by reading a psalm. I start in Psalm 1, read all the way through the Psalms to 150, and then start over. And I recently completed the Psalms and started again at Psalm 1 in my personal devotions. And I thought that perhaps today I'd talk about a psalm. But as I thought about it, I thought it might be better to give you a brief overview of the Psalms and what their content is so that you could sort of whet your appetite for reading the Psalms yourself. Now, the Psalms are in your Bible almost exactly in the middle, a little bit before the middle of the Bible, and the Psalms take up the most number of pages, 120 pages in the Bible that I regularly use. The Psalms are of varying length from two verses, Psalm 117, to 176 verses, Psalm 119. Um, the Hebrew Bible has a title of this book. The title is Tehillim, and that word means songs of praise. It was translated into Greek as psalmas and uh, came over in English in that form, but it means songs of praise, and that's a descriptive title of the book. Each psalm was written for the purpose of uh, either reciting, chanting, or more likely singing it in a public worship setting. And that's very important for us to understand. The Psalms were compiled to be together the songbook of Israel. And uh, we are instructed under the new covenant that we are not given a new songbook, but rather the Psalms comprise the songbook of the church. Now, some of the Psalms have uh, a heading, which is called a superscription. They're usually put in a different style of print. The heading can give any one of a number of uh, types of information that uh, would be helpful for you to know. Not all have a heading, but some uh, simply tell you who wrote the Psalm, like Psalm 27 simply says, of David, meaning by David. Some uh, contain a musical notation. Some of those are not even known what they mean anymore, but some are very clear, like Psalm 5 says, to the choir master for the flutes of David. Um, others give a notation that's a little longer that may tell you the setting uh, that gave rise to the psalm, and those are very important. For example, Psalm 51 tells us that this is a psalm that David wrote when he repented of his, his sin with Bathsheba. And so those kinds of psalms, which are relatively few in number, allow us to know exactly what the setting was that gave rise to the psalm, and we're able to go back into the historical books of the Bible and read about the event and then read the psalm. It, it gives a, a deeper understanding of what it's about. When they're taken together, the 150 psalms are sometimes called the Psalter. Um, the Psalter, that word means something like song book. And for the church, at least for the first 500 years of the Christian faith, the psalms were primarily what were sung in public worship. Early Christians began to add other songs that are found in the New Testament. Some of those are still used, particularly the Song of Mary in Luke chapter 2, called the Magnificat, um, the Song of Simeon, the Nunc Dimittis, and things like that are, were also added to the songs because they are basically psalms that were not included in the Old Testament Psalter. When the Reformation came in the 1500s, the Reformed churches returned to the use of the Psalter as the primary hymn book, and the psalms were put in meter and rhyme. That's called the metrical Psalter. Um, I grew up in a church that sang some of those, and the one we sang almost every week was Psalm 100. Um, few churches today, now that we're 500 years past that, use the Psalms anymore. It, it happened that they were used almost exclusively for about 200 years. In the late 1700s, churches began to add hymns and use Psalms. That continued 
for another 200 years. And in the last 100 years, the Psalms have been mostly lost. Churches that use the Psalms today, uh, if we sing one, it's usually just a verse of the Psalm, uh, rather than the whole Psalm being put in, into song form. But of all the things that, that are helpful for you to know, I think the most helpful to understand about the Psalms is that the Psalms were written and they were compiled together for the purpose of teaching God's people how to worship God, meaning how to worship him in a way that he accepts and receives and delights in. Of all the literature in the Bible, the Psalms are, are the literature that only or at least primarily contain only the words of human beings towards God. There are a few places in the Psalm where God, in Psalms where God speaks to us, but uh, usually it's expressions of the human heart towards God and the feelings that people have. And the Psalms, when they were compiled together and they became a part of the canon of Scripture, they are meant to teach us how to bring our hearts to him, how to worship him in a way that he accepts and he delights in. In other words, each individual psalm is an expression of a worshiper's feelings towards God, feelings of uh, joy, praise, sorrow, bewilderment, lament, and even anger. In some cases, we have evidence that that the psalm uh, was uh, what was removed from it were some personal aspects of the nature of what was going on in order that all worshipers could use it. For example, Psalm 51, David's psalm of repentance. If David included in that psalm a precise statement of the nature of his sin, which was adultery and murder, the result would have been that few worshipers would have been able to use it because relatively few people could identify with both of those things as their personal sins. However, when the psalm is put in without a statement of the exact nature of the sin, all worshipers are able to use Psalm 51 as a psalm of repentance because all of us understand the power of sin in our lives. So Christians consider the Psalms to be God's word written. They're part of his revelation to us. In this case, they reveal to us how God longs to be worshiped. What that means is he took, God took individual expressions of various feelings, again, sorrow, bewilderment, even feelings of uh, that maybe God isn't as good as he says that he is, like in Psalm 73. He took all of those feelings and he put them together in such a way that the finished psalm, as it's put in the Psalter, helps us learn what it means to bring our hearts to God and to express those kinds of feelings in a way that God owns and delights in. He wants to teach us how to worship him in reality as we struggle on our pilgrim journey. And the only way to learn that is to read the psalms pray the psalms, sing the psalms every day, over and over and over as we go through life.